Today, uh, I will share with you my academic research about architecture. And I have separated my presentation today in three different parts. Each part begins with a key question. Let's start with the first one, which is actually, I think, the most critical. What is the role of the architect today? It is a common belief that architects design buildings. And this statement, I must say, is partly true. However, this is not the only thing we do. What I want to make clear to you today is that architects should be considered as thinkers of a much bigger scale. And this scale is the scale of the city. To make this transition from the small scale of the building to the vast scale of the city, I have to introduce you a very important architectural term. And this term is context. I will explain this complicated architectural notion by sharing with you a personal story, which actually starts when I was a student here in Bath. Since the beginning of my studies, I wanted to understand what context was. I thought that context was meant to be something physical. So buildings fit to their context when they become a coherent continuation with their immediate natural surroundings. For this reason, my first architectural hero was Frank Lloyd Wright, and my favorite building was the Falling Water in Pennsylvania. As you can see, architecture becomes one with its immediate sounding, uh, surrounding environment. However, with the passing of the years, I realized that this definition of context was not adequate. <coughs> with my final year project here in Bath, I designed a drug rehabilitation center. I realized that the impact of architecture expands much further beyond the limits of the walls. Another dimension has to inform context. And this dimension was the dimension of the social. And this was a very important realization for me. I continued my studies, and I went to the Dutch University of TU Delft. And I was dedicated in understanding this new dimension of architecture. With the support of my teachers, I realized that I was becoming part of a new generation of architects that explored the social dimension of architecture by shifting their perspective from the small scale of the building to the big scale of the city. These architects, they give up their powers as absolute designers of buildings. Instead, they analyze the invisible dynamics that shape, form the urban environment. In this case, context is not any more physical. Context becomes invisible. To study these invisible forces that shape the urban environment, I proposed the following definition of context. Context takes the form <coughs> of a historical analysis of the urban growth. It takes the form of a study that shows how the city changes through time, and how this change is actually influenced by three very important factors. The political, the economic, sorry, the social, and the economic, <coughs> these invisible forces. Uh, so the first task of the architect is to create a timeline where he maps and interrelates different political, social, and economic events and how they translate back to the city. I think this exercise makes, gives the, the architect the possibility to propose a vision that responds to the key problems of the city. I will give you an example of such an investigation. For my final year project at TU Delft, I decided to choose Athens as a case study. I'm very happy to share with you that this project was selected by the TU Delft to represent it in the national competition in the Netherlands. As you know, Athens is a city <coughs> greatly defined by these economic, political, and social forces. In the second part of this uh, presentation, as I said, I will start again with a key question. How is the city transformed by invisible dynamics. <coughs> this is an image of the current condition of Athens. As you can see, an urban lava spreads all over the topography and geography of the city. If we look closer, what makes the city unique is the fact that it is made out of the repetition of the same exact unit, spread everywhere. <coughs> it is through the evolution of this specific unit that I will try to share with you how 
political, social and economic forces shape, transform the urban environment. But first, let me give you some information about this unit. In Greek, it is called the polykatechia, which means multi-story apartment building. As you can see, it is a very homogeneous typology. This uh, model, the polykatechia, allowed high advanced industrial solutions for that period with the use of, however, of low skilled manual labor. What makes this uh, model unique is that it is open to change. The internal configuration and the, and the skin of the building can be redesigned for the reason that the load of the building is not anymore supported by its walls. It is supported by specific points that transfer the, lean, the, the load to the ground. This gives us a unique possibility. We can propose an alternative urban scenario without the need of demolishing buildings, but on the contrary, by acting within the existing structure. And this is a very important difference when we think of how we can change the city. I'm sorry. As I said, I will present you the evolution of the city through the, evo the, the evolution of this unit. We start in 1843, where the Greek state is established. With the support and direct influence of foreign countries, the first master plan of the city is designed. The neoclassical architectural language is decided to revive the ancient Greek ideals. It was an effort to make clear, to indicate that Greece was now becoming part of the West. It was actually an effort to introduce the capitalist economy into the Greek society, and that through architecture. Our second period starts in 1922, and the, where the state implements a very important law, the law of horizontal property. For the first time in Greece, and in Athens especially, multiple properties can coexist in the same piece of land, but in different heights. This law <coughs> gave birth to the unit of polykatechia, the one I introduced you before. Our next period ends with the, uh, with the end of the civil war and the defeat of the communist forces in Athens. The new democratic government, in order to avoid the rebellious potential of a working class, it minimized the industrial concentrations. Instead, they promoted a small-scale building economy that could fragment and thus control the population. Architecture becomes a powerful economic, political and social tool used by the state to control its population. It was a tool that allowed a lower class to make the transition to a middle class that was in the same time consumer and producer of space, of architecture. In 1975, Greece enters the European Union, which coincides with a long-term economic growth through the exploitation of built space. The private space superimposes the public. High density, high traffic, high pollution start to make the city center unbearable. The Athenians they start to abandon the city center, while a new flow of immigrants start to inhabit it. For those who leave, the city center is a nostalgic memory. For those who come, is a place for a better future. During our last period, which starts in 2000, it's, it coincides with a very big wave of suburbanization. The Athenians start to leave the center in order to find housing in the periphery, and actually the state provides laws to make this suburban growth more profitable. This, uh, actually, my family, we used to live in the city center, and we decided that we have to go to the suburbs for a better quality of life. This phenomenon accelerated these abandonment rates, making the social segregation between the, in the, the different neighborhoods of the city center even more apparent. This drawing shows the current condition of the polykatechia. What I wanted to make clear with this drawing was the abandonment of what is considered collective space, like the internal courtyards or the common roofs, and 
if we look closer, we can see the high levels of decay and abandonment of the units that compose the polykatechia. We can see the narrow uh, character of what is circulation space and ventilation shafts. The hybrid nature of the different users occupying the same building. And finally, what I want to show with this overall picture is the high level of fragmentation between the different units. The inhabitants have minimum space for social interaction with each other. And we arrive to the last part of this presentation, where the question is now, how can we change the city by rethinking the street? In this part, <coughs> I will introduce you my vision about Athens. Actually, it's an alternative urban model, which I name City of Crossroads. This model is based on mobility, accessibility, and porosity. It is actually an urban model that rethinks how movement is, uh, is done in the city. As an architect, I wasn't interested to redesign a building. I was interested to find new patterns of movement that could actually change the city. The current condition of the street is like that. <coughs> with black, we see the buildings. With red, we see the street. And with white, the internal courtyards. I believe that if we want cities that resist the forces imposed by the state or the private domain, if we want cities where we can all actively participate in the development of urban space, then I think we need to renegotiate the relationship between the private nature of the building and the public nature of the street. Actually, the urban model I propose works more like this. On the ground floor, we start to make the build mass more porous, so that the building and the street start to intersect. The building becomes part of the street, and the street becomes part of the building. If we put these two models next to each other, what we see is that with the model I propose, the courtyards, the buildings, and the streets start to make a new network, a new network on the ground floor for the citizens to move freely around the city. In order to give you a bit more, a feeling more of this new movement of the city, I had this section where you can see how the street now enters the building and expands in multiple levels in the urban mass. Elevated streets starts to create generous conditions for meaningful, uh, uh, meaningful social interaction and expression. I believe that the typology of the labyrinth nicely describes the feeling of this new movement of the city, where, as citizens, we can move around the city in search of an authentic and new experience of the city. The geometry of the labyrinth helps in achieving such spontaneous interaction with, the, with our co-citizens. In order to make this new Athenian labyrinth, I realized that we have to change a very specific element of the street. And this element is that of the crossroad, where different movements meet. And I will show you how this model works. First, we map the existing traffic arteries of the city. With purple, we see the high-speed traffic arteries. With Mid with orange, the medium speed arteries, and with blue, just a few blue uh, pedestrian streets. You cannot even see them, they're just so few. I believe that if we model this map, and to make it more abstract, but it to, to, to convey the same information, I uh, also introduce in the points of intersections these nodes. These nodes, these circular symbols, represent different types of crossroads. As you can see, I believe that this model shows that the car movement is far more important than the pedestrian, which results in a city which is made only out of a few types of crossroads. The new model I propose, the city of crossroads, works like this. First, we map the existing public spaces. Then, we introduce the high-speed traffic arteries, which are necessary for the function of the modern city. These traffic arteries separate the map into different sectors. Then, we introduce the medium-speed traffic arteries that separate the sectors into smaller neighborhoods. Finally, the rest of the, the streets become pedestrian. If we put the two models one next to each other, 
the new model, I believe, shows that the pedestrian movement in cities becomes equally important as the car movement, which results in a city made of multiple different crossroads. I would like to conclude this part by taking you through a journey around this Athenian labyrinth. <coughs> Our journey begins from the ground floor, where you can see that the interaction between the building and the street is much more blurred, making the conditions for this spontaneous and open movement on the ground floor. You can find yourselves in spaces of intense activity, like this one. Or you can find yourselves in spaces of serenity and silence. The enclosed courtyards take, are freed from the side walls and they provide the condition for social interaction, but also for individual reflection. The explorer of the city interacts with these linear auditoriums. These auditoriums, instead of just being functional connectors between different levels of the city, they become active places for social interaction. The citizens can observe the daily life of the city using these elements. We go higher into the urban mass. We are now inside the buildings, where these elevated streets separate, or actually even better, connect the different individual units. <coughs> A generous collective space is formed in between the individual units that allows this meaningful social interaction to happen between the inhabitants. You now get to know your neighbor. A physical, a physical web is spread like a labyrinth inside the urban mass and replaces the virtual one that we so, so much use today to socialize with each other. We arrive on the top of the city, on the roofs, where you can connect with the amazing blue Mediterranean sky and you can enjoy the panoramic views that are offered from this level of the city, which is so much unused today. With a final image, I would like to celebrate the feeling of the street, the importance of the street, in the greater extent. The street takes the form of elevated bridges that span over the city and connect different areas with no restriction, in any direction. They become these elevated platforms for social interaction and for pedestrian activity. To summarize, I want to leave you with the following message. This project is not meant to be an absolute solution for the city. Its purpose is to act as a critique to the key problems of the city and maybe so a direction for change. Actually, I don't believe that we need an architect to design our cities for us. But I do believe that we need the street as a place where we can all of us come together to negotiate the future of the city collectively. Thank you very much. <laughs>